Jeremiah Wright, let's take this a step further, if we might, sir, uh, and ask you to comment on that same, that same, that same question. What is it about so many African-American preachers uh, that allows them to come to church every Sunday morning and to, and to preach until we shout and the choir sings until we shout, but Monday through Saturday, they ain't got no programs, no services, nothing serving African-American people. What is it about that? I mean, I, I can't imagine, King was a brilliant man, but I can't imagine that he was so bright, so bright that he understood how important that intersection is and that so many are missing that today. What's wrong? Tavis, I want to join with the other panelists in thanking you for assembling this group of persons. I don't control the mic. I'm sorry. <laughs> they, they can hear you now, Doc. Yes, Go ahead. Um, but one of the, there's several things, and, and I was hoping Dr. Taylor, as the senior statesman on the panel, would say something about this because he was a contemporary of Dr. King's. Um, but he's being kind. Um, the main issue we have not done, Cornell West always says we don't define terms, so we talk all around stuff. We haven't defined what the black church is. Now, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But to respond to your question, Dr. King was not popular among African Americans until after he was dead. Uh, all right? Uh, Dr. King headed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And to us up north, that was their problem. In Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, the following was not large. It was not large, and in Chicago, the following was anti-King. Chicago was the home of Olivet Baptist Church, Joseph H. Jackson, who sided with Mayor Daley. They did not want King, they didn't want Jesse, so he didn't have no following like until after, you know, it's like everybody walking around a piece of wood, see this from the original cross, everybody became a King follower after he was shot and killed. Um, so that because, and one of the problems, one of the problems that, that causes what you're asking is, Dr. King was seminary trained, my brother. All right, so, so where, you get the comp, where you get the intersection of the social and the theological hermeneutic, 90% of African-American clergy persons are not seminary trained. All right, I, can, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot be a lawyer if I don't go to law school. I cannot be a doctor if I don't go to med school. But all I got to do is turn around my collar and hallelujah, I've got the anointing and I got 50,000 Negroes following me. All right? So, no, it ain't what the theology of King, the theology of King, but then again, I mean, the theology of King, trying to answer you, that's, that's one reason. That's one reason, all right? But to, to try to follow through, the, the, the whole, the whole, the, there's some other issues that they're late, that's multi-layered in terms of the disconnect. Dr. Taylor also mentioned in the fest shift for him at Interdenomination Theological Center, which you said, Eugene, about the disconnect between Africa and African Americans. That's a, that's a long, long, long historical problem. And that goes back to the definition of the black church. When you say the black church, when we say the black church, we got to realize we're talking about a kaleidoscope of reality in terms of theology, in terms of hermeneutics, in terms of training, in terms of what have become known as denominations, in terms of what it takes to start a church, what kind of church, turn your collar around, you got a church. Um, uh, what do you mean the black? Because to talk, about, to talk about perfecting, to talk about city of refuge, to talk about uh, National Baptist, Progressive National Baptist, African Methodist Episcopal, Christian Methodist, you're talking all over the map in terms of what is the black church. And, and there have been those different streams running through the definition historically since the 1700s and that are still there. There's also been a disconnect, as Eugene said, between, between African and African Americans, but also between the living word that we hear on Sunday and the life we have to live on Monday. Uh, Kelly Brown Douglas says we can't talk about homosexuality because we can't talk about sexuality. Come on down. So that so that there's that kind of that, that kind of perpetuated uh, propagation of ignorance that goes on on Sunday mornings that has nothing to do with the life I live on Monday morning. And it's not just in the mega churches; it's in the storefront churches that will get me high for for two hours. I feel good, but then I got to go back into hell on Monday or Sunday afternoon. So that, 
That's why King, King, no, King had a large following of seminary. In fact, if you look at the guys and girls he, he surrounded himself with, that's one type of clergy that you do not find overwhelmingly standing in the pulpits of the African-American pulpits in the year 2003. Let me... I, I can't get it. I just said that. I, work on the side. I want you to know, I want you to note that as I ask this next question, I'm looking this way. I'm not trying to cast dispersion on anybody on this, on this panel or the second panel, and I mean that sincerely. But I'm looking this way because I want to pick up on something that, that uh, Jeremiah Wright raises without casting dispersion on anybody on this panel or the one coming behind us. But Jeremiah Wright, you raised an issue about the fact that when we called King the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he sure enough was a Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Every black preacher I know wants to be called the Reverend Dr. So-and-so. I'm looking this way. Everybody wants to be called the Reverend Dr. So-and-so. Noel Jones, you were known as one of the foremost intellectuals in ministry in this country. Talk to me about the challenge that that presents for the African-American church when we have folk who are not trained in seminary and whether or not that is, in fact, is Jeremiah Wright right? Is that a requirement, given that so many of us believe that all you got to be is spirit-filled, and if the Lord speaks to you from on high, that's all you need on Sunday morning, Doc. Hope is on. Uh, I, I, I just want to say thanks for having me here. I don't know how much gratitude I want to show right about now, but I'm... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, no, well, well, at, at least they won't say I'm playing favorites with my pastor. <laughs> no, nonetheless, I, I think it's quite significant the point that uh, Dr. Wright is raising, uh, and I think it's essential that we define the 21st century church because from what I'm hearing, it seems as if the church is actually the black preacher. The church is the black preacher. It's, it's, from what I'm hearing, it seems as if the church is a black preacher because the people in the pews don't set policy. Uh, the, the committees are losing their strength. And if you notice carefully, what has happened is when Pentecostalism became the leading denomination and the fastest growing denomination, it changed many dynamics in the whole traditional Christian black African Christian world. What happens is the Pentecostals' primary objective was to think heavenward. If you were to consider the apostolic Pentecostal in particular, you will notice that the greatest thing that a person could achieve was the new birth experience, the baptism in Jesus' name, the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Now what happens there is that the focus immediately went to the other world into getting into heaven. And the faith of the Pentecostal was meet God, have a spiritual experience, let's get to heaven. The traditional church, on the other hand, dealt so much with those contemporary things that were mundane, uh, mundane to operate their lives that there was a problem between the Pentecostals and the traditional church particularly when the Pentecostal church literally evangelized the traditional church because it is out of the traditional church that many people went into the Pentecostal movement and consequently there was a rift between both groups. The neo-Pentecostals, the charismatics and the faith preachers, they came along and took the faith to get to heaven and then they turned it into health, wealth, and prosperity. And so, so all of a sudden now, we're teaching faith that was originally Hebrews chapter 10, closing faith to salvation, and it becomes a now faith, as a substance of things hoped for, of course, and it, the now was subject to subjective theology, and it now began to deal with the issues of being rich having money. 
this further divided us because now faith became, became an individual affair. So if you have the faith, then of course you can get whatever you want from God. So the church stopped dealing with the whole issues of suffering because under that presentation, God will miraculously do things for you. So if you come down the aisle with 20 or $30 and I lay hands on you, then of course, immediately all of your trials will be over. Now, the thing that happens here is, because of this presentation, because every presentation needs theology to make it strong. If there's no hermeneutical substratum for this presentation, then of course now we're going to have a problem because theology has to leave something in people's minds psychologically. And if you tell me that God is going to bless me by simply bringing something to you, and I don't have a plan, because when I'm preaching and I'm making that presentation, I have to have a plan. And the plan is if I've got 6,000 people out there, 3,000 will give me $25. But now, what is the plan for those who brought the money? Well. Now, now, now understand this, understand this. And, and, and I'm in the middle of it myself. I mean, I'm in the middle of it myself. Understand this. When people bring money based on a theology, that God is supernaturally going to respond that eliminates the development theology that is necessary to make people change their lives. And once the presentation is made, people need opportunity. Now here's where opportunity comes. Because we don't have to ask committees anymore to decide who they want to be with. And we have even eliminated using denomination as titles for our churches. We don't call our churches particular Baptist church or apostolic church today. What we do is we give a name out there that everybody can come to that ministry and deal with that ministry because we don't want to be slated denominationalism. We don't market denomination. We market individuals today. Wherever you go, the church is personality driven. It is not institutionally driven any longer. It's personality driven. So the wonderful thing about it though, because it's not all uh, pejorative, the wonderful thing about it is that you don't have to bring Baptist Methodists together. For instance, in my city, I don't have to have City of Refuge vote or decide to have anything to do with Faithful Central, vote or decide to have anything to do with West Angeles, or decide to do anything with fame, because it's not institutionally driven. The churches don't have to come together, but Noel Jones ought to get together with Charles Blake, and Charles Blake ought to get together with Chip Murray, and Chip Murray ought to get together with Kenneth Ulmer, and put all our monies in the same bank, <laughs> and make the opportunity for the people in our churches. Because money talks in America. I managed. <laughs> Let me. <laughs> no, Jones. Bless you. Well, Bishop Jones, uh, they, 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 they used to call y'all, you, you, forgive, you forgive the phraseology, they used to call y'all poverty pimps, and now they call you prosperity preachers. So the vernacular has changed. I think that's a good thing, from poverty pimps to prosperity preachers. But Shakespeare asked the question, what's in a name? A rose by any other name would still smell just as sweet. Whether it's poverty pimps or prosperity preachers, there are a lot of folk who think there is too much focus, too much emphasis in the black church on materialism, on money, on gain. You heard what James Cone said earlier. Talk to me about that. And, that, and I raise that question only because I want to expand this conversation to talk about this, this phenomenon called the mega church. It seems to me as one on the outside looking in that one of the reasons why 
one of the reasons why the mega church is such a phenomenon now is we got pre 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 people preaching every Sunday, you know, that if you do this, if you do that, if you give me this, if you do this, you can have all of this. So it's that prosperity message that I think is packing out some of these so-called mega churches. But, but, but talk to me about that, if you will. Well, one of the things that's so wrong is, is that theology actually sets in the mind of people a certain psychological view of life particularly in a church situation where there is so much influence coming from the man who is standing as the voice of God. And oftentimes it fails to deal with the real issues of suffering and the real issues of, of, of a problematic world and difficult times. This is why America had so much difficulty dealing with 9-11. And 9-11 forced so many Americans to even question the existence of God simply because they were not prepared for the tragedy that other people of the world go through all the time. I, 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 will, I, I, will, I will point out to you the, the, the significance of, of truth. And again, much of the problem, the prosperity preaching, and, and even preaching period. And I think the question has to be asked, if you can't preach it in Somalia, is it gospel? Because oftentimes we have preached Americanism for the gospel. There, there are no lotteries in, in Zimbabwe. And so you can hit it rich in America uh, quite easily. But, but, but most of the time when people have made money and make it rich in America, there was a plan somewhere. There was a check in the mail, but the check did not come from heaven. It came from some specific place and certain circumstances allowed that money to come that way. And oftentimes, we have made ourselves rich simply preaching this hocus pocus gospel, and we have not developed the individuals to go after the opportunities that are before them. And, and, and and so, so consequently, we have a backlash because I go throughout the world and people will tell you, I gave in every offering. I did exactly what I was supposed to do. And I'm still struggling to meet my rent. I'm still having a hard time making my car payment. But the bottom line is, when you should have followed the stream of opportunities, you were out partying and doing a whole lot of stuff that you shouldn't have been doing. And one sermon is not going to change the outcome of your life. You have to sow positively and ministry must put people in the frame of mind that moving from one stage to the other is a process. There is no quick fix to our situation. And so consequently, it allows people to feel the stimulation of discipleship. You have to be a disciple in order to move from one place to the other. Most of the fellows who made it rich in ministry are disciples of their ministry. I mean, they work on it night and day. I have five million miles on American Airlines alone. I lost a wife running after ministry because everybody can't sit around and have you gone all the time. Oh, I might as well be real with it. Uh, 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 we have gone after this stuff in a way where we are driven. We are driven beyond the norm. And all of a sudden now, we're presenting a gospel that is to people no discipleship. Jesus had his fellows for three years. We want to just wake up and get called, and then we spiritualize every text. Uh, uh, one man said, the Lord spoke to me, so he opened his Bible and he pointed to the scripture and it said, Judas went and hung himself. He said, well, let me try this again. He flicked it open, touched the next one. And the scripture said, go thou and do likewise. He said, well, the baseball players get three tries. So he opened it again, he hit it again. That that thou doest, do it quickly. There, there, there has to be some hermeneutics to our presentation. But, but Bishop, but Bishop, let's be real about it. Since you said you want to be real, there, there, there isn't a lot of hermeneutics to the theology. What we get on television 
from these prosperity preachers. What we get in our pulpits on Sunday mornings from these prosperity preachers is that God told me that if you, to, to ask you to put $100 in the offering this morning. And that if you do that, the Lord told me to tell you because people are looking for a quick fix. It's like, it's like, it's like most black people supported the 911 number with all the, 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 the sorcerers and all the, the people who are going to read palms. That stuff was sent straight to black people because oftentimes we want a drug and the church becomes a drug where we can preach this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and people just subscribe. But that's not the way it is. You have to have discipline. You cannot overlook the principles of God and God go against his principles and make you rich. God is a God of principle. That's why medical science works. That's why aviation works. That's why you can put a boat in the ocean and it goes across the sea because there are principles and people want to bypass principles because they lack discipline. And the preacher wants to get rich on the ignorance of the people. You got to turn around and tell them the truth so that the only Bentley in the driveway is not yours. You got 20 out there. Very frankly, and to the point, is it money well spent? There's a big debate ongoing in our community about the millions upon millions upon millions of dollars that we spend building buildings. James Cone raised his point earlier that we, money we spend building buildings. There are a lot of folk in this audience, and I'm sure watching us around the country and around the world, who question, and I'm just asking the question here, but if I who question whether or, whether or not it is money, Jeremiah Wright, Bishop, you can get in on this in a minute. Jeremiah, if it's money well spent, as opposed to spending that money on programs and on services, we walk over homeless folk in some of these cities to get into the church. Is it money well spent? Uh, I must point out that you have to go back home and your pastor said he wants to answer that. I just want to point that out. You got to go back to your pastor. And he you can say, speak right after you. You say you don't care, Bishop Jones, let Jeremiah Wright ask that. You will hear from him when you get home. Uh, Paul Morton said, if we don't have no authority, then what are we leaving? <laughs> if your flock ignores you on national television. <laughs> I knew that was you need a disciple with some principles. You have an unprincipled disciple over here. Um, having said that, again, 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 we are playing with jello and the slippery all over the place. When you say, and just picture this, picture this, um, picture this, picture this as a congregation or a gathering of the elders from Judaism, Hasidic Jew, Reformed Jew, Conservative Jew, Jewish rabbi women. You got a multiplicity of definitions there. Yes. So just remember, we, we're all over the place. Some churches, yes, it's being spent well. Other churches, of course not. Some churches, there are no Bentleys in the driveway. But as Paul Morton said, you're doing millions in missions. Mega churches. Mega churches cannot have. We have been supporting a hospital in Salt Pond for 15 years. We built a computer school in Salt Pond. A small church cannot do that. We give away one-tenth of our budget. We've been given, we've given over half a million dollars to United Negro College Fund. We've given over half a million dollars in scholarship. A small storefront cannot do that. So yes, but we ain't every church. We ain't every church because some churches have half a million dollar pastor anniversary. Hallelujah. Watch out now. Watch out, watch out, watch out. So, but again, you're, you're all over the place in terms of when you say, is the money being spent by the mega churches, you have to define and name what mega churches you're talking about. You have to, and, and that's what I would just warn. So I would say in some instances, and what you're talking about most of the time what we see on television, no, but that's not, as, as Dr. Jump said, that's not all mega churches. Jacqueline Grant, I saw your hand. I want to come to you in one second because I don't want to be disfellowshipped. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be disfellowship when I get home to Los Angeles tomorrow morning. So, Bishop Jones, by all means, please speak, sir. 
Well, 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 well thank you, Tavis. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't have any problem with you telling me to shut up. I mean, that's fine. But nevertheless, I, I, I will agree with, with Dr. Wright. I think it's important for us to understand that the message, uh, one of my best friends and I argue all the time, how does God give favor? And I think the favor that God gives the preacher is, is the message. If he can touch the lives of people, he will never build a building big enough to house all the people who will want to hear what he has to say. Uh, uh, there is no question in my mind. But I have never heard of the deceitfulness of poverty. I've heard of the deceitfulness of riches. And, and oftentimes what happens is when we get to a certain level in ministry, we no longer feel what people feel. We no longer understand what they feel. For instance, if we were having church here today in a crowd like this and I got finished preaching, they would probably surround me so fast and walk me out of here so quickly that I wouldn't have an opportunity to shake anybody's hand or touch anybody. At a certain point in ministry, we no longer counsel. So we don't talk to people, so we don't know what their problems are. At a certain point in ministry, we move to the suburbs. And, and we no longer feel what people feel in the inner city. At, at, a, at a certain point in ministry, we, we lack absolutely nothing. And it becomes difficult to relate again to people who are struggling. And our offering, taken, our offering taking sometimes reflects the fact that we don't have a clue about what people can or cannot give because we initially we just stand up and we begin to call money it is it is it's not that i'm saying that a preacher shouldn't have anything and a mega church shouldn't be there because if the message is there the church is going to be big and people are going to come and lots of money going to be distributed and the preacher might take one percent now of what comes in as opposed to 50 percent when it was small i'm not saying that that's a problem but I'm saying that every man needs somebody to answer to. Well, well, as, as, as a, I was listening to the discourse uh, on the other side uh, and listening to ownership and just dealing with the issues, Dr. Dr. E. Lance uh, McCarty in, in Los Angeles left me a couple of uh, tips on my way here. And he said on any given Sunday, you have uh, 65, approximately 65,000 uh, African-American churches. On any given Sunday, that means you have 25 million members. On every given Monday, they put in the bank 50 million. On annually, it is 2 billion. The members spend in the American economy 300 billion dollars we're richer than many nations i am saying to myself as i thought about that and i listened to dr cones about us gathering together where there are no cameras what would happen in america if all of us would forget our denominational hang-ups and decided to bank in an international bank altogether. Now, with those statistics, uh, Dr. McCarthy still says that 70% of our churches are turned down when they go to the bank. What would happen if we, if we leveraged that money, all came together, put it in one place, used all these brilliant black minds that we have to give us direction? Because as preachers, oftentimes, we are just creative in the Bible. And when it comes to preaching every Sunday, your time is spent so much in studying the Word of God and trying to deliver the Word, yet we have people in our congregations who are extremely astute at business and all kinds of other things. Why can't we humble ourselves a little bit, let somebody put a program together, somebody become our conscience, bring us all together, and make this thing work for all of us.
you asked, you asked, your question was about HIV AIDS. Right. What is the black church not doing that we should be doing? Um, I would say two things practically. One, doing what Dr. Cohn and Dr. McKenzie said outright. I, I hinted at it subtly by saying, I want you to picture a Hasidic Jew, Orthodox Jew, conservative Jew, reformed Jew. Jews would not have TV cameras present talking about the Jewish community. All right? We need, the first thing we need to be doing is what, what Dr. Cohn said and what Vashti said, we need to have some, a meeting privately to talk about among ourselves what we need to do collectively, all right? Because the same issue that keeps coming up with this anti-intellectualism, the same bifurcation between seminary, non-seminary, your theology, you love, you love that word, but how you see God, how you see, if I see God as a male, right. white, long beard, then I see Humans, anthropology is determined by my theology. I see humans as male superior, white male superior. White men, white women, black men, black women. And, and hierarchically, I'm, my theology has messed me up. And how I see anthropology determines how I order my society. Theology determines anthropology, determines sociology, but we can't talk about that in front of cameras because a lot of folk who think being saved means I'm no longer black, we need to be locked, to close the door, lock horns and talk to one another, all right? But very practically, very practically, very practically, I have been, and I need Tom Joyner's help, and I need the media, now that he owns his own company, maybe he can do this. Uh, we need the media, Tavis. We need the media too, you too, all right? Because you and Tavis, Tavis and Tom reach a hundred times more black folk than we do on Sunday morning. And they're listening to you all, all right? They're listening to hey, you hey, all. Hey, Tom, we should start taking tithes and offerings in. And here, here's the point, here's the point. What ought the black church be doing? Well, in addition to the whole theological understanding of sin and that AIDS is a biological issue, not a theological one, all right? In addition to that, put that one aside, we need to do what we did back in the 60s. Martin, Martin asked Dr. Taylor, he's here, he was there, I was here. The sit-ins, the pray-ins, all that wonderful public demonstration did nothing to change anything. It brought public attention and the cameras, but the changes came after the sit-ins were over, after the wait-ins were over and the pray-ins were over, we sat down with legislators to get laws changed. You talking about public policy? All right, call it where it is, your sermon. Until Pfizer and Merck and the pharmaceuticals do here what they did in South Africa and in Brazil and allow the generic drugs, antiretroviral, everybody can't afford what Magic Johnson can afford. And until we do that, we ain't done nothing about AIDS. So that's what the black church ought to be doing about AIDS. Okay. <laughs> this question says it's from a black mother. Most of our men are in prison. Most of our children are failing in school. Most of us mothers are weary of trying to fix it all. What is the black church's role in building up its families? The black church has to hit the street. The black church has to hit the street. The reality is that young boys are being raised on the streets in the absence of responsible role models. If we've got 65,000 black churches in America, we have to ask ourselves, why is there an inverse relationship between the presence of black churches and their relative absence on the corners and streets where our children live? We've got a generation of orphans that in too many cases, the black church is ignoring. So we got to move from the pulpit and the pews into the streets and advocate for the widow and the orphan. I just, I just needed to, to raise a question just so we can stay critically thinking, people. If we keep hearing over and over again, is the black church healthy for black women? That black women are 60 to 70 percent of our congregations. They are mostly single mothers, tired, working, giving too much money. We only got 30% of the brothers there and we working them to death because they're only 30%, so they're doing everything. 
who's gonna hit the street, Gene? You want the women? You want these single mothers who are already tired to hit the streets? When you say the black church, we need to hit the streets, you talking about Jackie's women. Who are you talking about hitting the street? Let's be real. Let's don't do applause sound bites. Let's do some. What do we do about the church? Each church needs to do something. Hitting the streets might not necessarily be it. She got to work every day. She got choir rehearsal. She got Bible study. She ain't gonna hit no streets. She ain't got no time. Duh. Ask Miss Dupree. No, 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 no. Ask Miss Dupree. No, 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 no. All right, all right. All right. No, 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 no. Let me push back on that, Jeremiah. Oh, no, 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 no. Listen. No, Doc. No, no, no. That's too easy. Look. There are black men in the churches. There are black men in the churches. In your and we, church. No, hold up, Doc. Your church. No, hold up, Doc. Let's be specific. You're no, talking I mean about your specific. church. No, no, I'm not talking All about right. my church. No, I'm saying in black America on the planet Earth, in the hood. You've, ta you've taken hold a on, survey. Doc. Hold on, Doc. You've done a survey. I'm saying, right? no, 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 no. Because I'm saying that if we black preachers were to choose to set more examples where we connected hips with lips, and were available, just visible, Doc. I'm not saying that we gotta rub shoulders with the uncouth and the unwashed. I'm simply saying that there is more that black men in the church can do to be visible and available to that mother that ain't got that child. That's all I'm saying, Doctor. But they ain't the ones in church. When no, you no, say no, no. The, when we you say the black church. church needs to hit the street, you got oh, yes. this, we still got this nebulous, what is the black church? Them brothers that made the babies, they ain't coming up to listening to you. What's, which one? They ain't in the church. Which one? They ain't coming to church. Oh, no, no, so no, they, no. they already hitting it. No. They hitting it all right. Wow. But it ain't, you know, come on now. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. What do you say? No, I hear what he said. Uh, no, I hear what he said. No, what did he say? <laughs> no, no. So.